last uh, weekend I had the opportunity along with my wife to visit two other campuses. We were at the 10 o'clock service at Romeo and then the 1130 service at Lake Orion. And it was just such a joy to hear two different guys uh, preach uh, the same message uh, through their own personality, and it was just wonderful. And uh, over probably 12 years ago now, uh, we started with just this campus, and in the last 12 years, we've started 13 other campuses during that time period. And each time, uh, in, in that number, by the way, is just kind of insane. When you look at church growth and you look at... Um, what it does, every time we start another campus, what it does to the sending campus in terms of resources, people and financial resources, and to do it that often um, would not be advisable uh, around the country, and yet it's the way the Lord has led us. And uh, so I want to thank you for your sacrifice, thank you for believing in a vision, and I want to tell you here this morning that it's working. Uh, more and more people are coming to know Jesus, and I can tell you... Uh, just a, what a joy it is for my heart to know that while I'm preaching this message this morning, there are 14 other men around this region that are preaching the same message. That they don't, those locations don't need to see me on a video screen. They can see these, many of them, very, very gifted young men that are preaching the gospel and God is using them in fantastic ways. So uh, it's working, folks, and thank you. Thank you for your investment and thank you for believing. I don't know if, if, um, if your house is like ours, like we'll have a, a jigsaw puzzle. There are a few things in life I find more annoying than a jigsaw puzzle. But we'll have it out in, on a table and all, you know, a thousand pieces or 500 pieces. And well, people walk by and put a few pieces in and a few days it's done. Except for there's one piece missing. And somebody along the way put it in their pocket or put it in a vase or something so they could be the last one to put the last piece in, okay? Um, or maybe you're sitting down for dessert with your family and simultaneously you take the fork and put it into the, the cake or the pudding, whatever it is, and you eat. And as you're eating, you think, this is horrible. Does that ever happen? Now, in an investigation, you found that whoever around that table made that dessert forgot one ingredient. Or maybe they were putting it together and they didn't have that ingredient, so they used a substitute that was insufficient. So it was horrible. There's a missing ingredient. And I've learned over the years, when listening to stories, whether it's on television or whether it's in my office or in our family, as I listen to that story, and if the story doesn't make sense, there's usually a missing piece of information. And I have to find out what that missing piece is before I can offer any advice or come to any conclusions or any observations. What is the missing piece of information? I want to share with you a story this morning that has a missing piece of information. Would you join me in your Bibles in Mark chapter 9? Mark chapter 9, we're in this series called In Focus, uh, bringing Jesus into clear focus. And if, but while you're turning there, Mark chapter 9, let me give you a little bit of the background. And that is uh, the first seven chapters of the book of Mark. It's one miracle right after another. And in these miracles, Jesus is showing that He's God, that He's control over nature, He's control over disease, that He is the Messiah, the promised one. I mean, one right after another for seven chapters, and all the time the disciples are with Him. And in fact, in chapter 4, when He calmed the sea, the disciples are saying, who is this? That even when He speaks, the seas are calm. They didn't answer the question. And they get to chapter 8, and all of a sudden, the Holy Spirit is like putting a foot on the brake. And the, the, the speed of all of this comes to a halt. And it almost seems as if Jesus is directing his attention from the miracles to the disciples. So the disciples can learn everything that they needed to learn in order to pick up the baton and continue the work after Jesus was gone. He's preparing them. And so last week we looked, and Jesus took three of those disciples, Peter, James, and John, to the top of a mountain. And on that mountain, in those moments or hours, the humanity of Jesus was pulled aside, and they were able to see who Jesus really was. He was the Son of God. He was God. And His glory and His majesty were so brilliant that these three men were spellbound. 
Along with Jesus, there was uh, Moses and Elijah. And remember, Peter said, um, if I can paraphrase, this is really cool. Why don't we just stay here and we'll build houses or tents or booths for Peter or for, for Moses and Elijah for Jesus? And Jesus said, no. We were never designed to live on the mountaintop. Because on the mountaintop, we see the glory and the majesty of God, but in the valleys are the hurts and needs of people. And God intended us while we live in this life to, on the mountaintop, receive what we need, to take it to the valley, to give it to those who are needy. It could be the poor, it could be the homeless, it could be those who don't know Jesus yet. It could be in the story of this week, a man whose son was possessed by a demon. So I look at our Sundays and we come together uh, as the mountaintop, and we're gathered together to, to go to the throne of God, to, to worship here, to be overwhelmed with His greatness. And then this afternoon and tomorrow, come from the mountain into the valleys of the workplace, the schools, the neighborhoods, and take the grace of God into the valleys. We'll come back to the mountain next week as we worship together. Have you found Mark chapter 9? Okay, good. Mark chapter 9. What I want to do here in this, find this missing piece is what I'd like to do is uh, read a paragraph, make a couple of comments or observations, read another paragraph, make a couple more observations, make sure everyone's awake at that point, whether you're here in the uh, worship center or whether you're at home, we want to make sure you're awake. And then I'll read another paragraph, make a couple of observations, and then we'll... Uh, give you two things to grab onto for this week, okay? Let's read the first paragraph, starting in verse 14 of chapter 9. When they, when they came to the disciples, they saw a great crowd around them and the scribes arguing with them. And immediately all the crowd, when they saw him, Jesus, were greatly amazed and ran up to him and greeted him. And he asked them, what are you arguing about with them? And someone from the crowd answered him, teacher, I brought my son to you, for he has a spirit that makes him mute. And whenever it seizes him, it throws him down, and he foams and grinds his teeth and becomes rigid. So I asked your disciples to cast it out, and they were not able. And he, Jesus, answered them, O faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him to me. We read in this story of, of a man uh, like any parent, we've seen it this week on television, of uh, a father uh, so impassioned for his three daughters who were abused, uh, lunges towards the defendant who abused him. A father of passion. Can you imagine the passion of this father? That he's seen his son ever since childhood, his son possessed by this demon, at times would leave him mute and cast on the, the ground and... Uh, and we'll read on to find out just how terrible it was. The father couldn't do anything about it. There's no medicine for demon possession. And by the way, when you see a passage of Scripture like this, um, and there are things you can't explain, and may I encourage you, what I've always done through the years is ask three questions in, the, in this order. Whenever you can't explain something, say, is there a natural explanation? In other words, is there a physical explanation? Uh, go to the doctor. Is there something going on here physically, uh, chemically? Secondly, is there a psychological or emotional um, explanation? And thirdly, is there a supernatural or demonic explanation? I think too often there are some who quickly go to number three and say this is demonic. In this case, it was. It was. We've had situations on our campuses through the years that have been bizarre, just bizarre. And it would be so easy to go number, to number three and saying, this is the, wicked, the work of the wicked one. We had one a few years ago, and we dug in a little bit deeper, and law enforcement was involved and so forth. We found that this person had, first of all, not been taking her medication, and secondly, uh, had been gone going for days without sleep. And sleep deprivation can cause a person to do some bizarre things. 
And so as, a, as the, a church community, we're able to come alongside this person who wasn't part of our church family and minister to her in a powerful way. So those three, it's always good to go in that order. Natural, physical explanation, uh, psychological or, or emotional, uh, and thirdly, is it supernatural or perhaps demonic? Okay? So here's this father. He brings this child to Jesus. Now, Jesus was up in the mountain with Peter, James, and John. So the four of them are coming down to meet the other nine disciples. This man had approached the nine disciples in Jesus' absence and said, and the book of Luke tells us, he begs them as he begged Jesus, heal my son. And they weren't able to do it. And so they were arguing, and the text would seem to indicate that Jesus and the other three disciples came and almost uh, came un unnoticed at first. And then when they noticed him, they ran to, him, to them. And Jesus said, what are you arguing about? When Jesus asks a question, it's never because he doesn't know the answer. Never. So why would he ask the question? He's trying to engage people, trying to get you to answer the question. He says, what are you arguing about? And the man said, well, I brought my son. He needs so much help. And the disciples couldn't heal him. And Jesus said something here. He says, how long do I have to live with you like this? How long are you going to have no faith or little faith? How long? The emphasis of the passage here is that these people needed help from God. And, were, and this man was crying out to God. Let's read the next paragraph and make a couple more observations. And they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw him, the evil spirit, the demonic spirit, saw Jesus, immediately it convulsed the boy, and he fell on the ground and rolled about foaming at the mouth. And Jesus asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And as often he cast him into the fire and into water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. And Jesus said to him, if you can, all things are possible for one who believes. Immediately the father cried out and said, I believe, help my unbelief. When we look at this passage, there are a couple of things that I want to draw to your attention. Is off, he casts him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. The father is distraught. But he uses a couple of words here. But if. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. If we could change anything about this script, it would be to delete two words. Where this man would say, you can do anything. Have compassion on us and help us. But because he includes those two words, he's admitting his doubt. And Jesus, those are the words that he caught and he emphasized, and he repeats them. If you can, in other words, are you doubting me? And he goes on to give this promise, all things are possible for him who believes. So he's saying, he's saying to this father, do you believe? Do you believe? With God, all things are possible. And he's saying to his disciples as well, the situation here is not a matter of my ability. It's a matter of your lack of faith. That's the missing piece. God can do anything. And the man goes on to say, I believe. Help my unbelief. And I want to say, make up your mind. Do you believe or don't you believe? I believe. Help my unbelief. Is it possible to have unbelief and belief at the same time? What do you think? Anybody guilty of that? As charged. We can articulate publicly our faith in that we believe, but inwardly we can have some doubts. The man, and it, I love the fact that he's honest with this. He says, I believe, but I've got some doubts. And he's not defending his doubts. He's asking help for his doubts. That's very instructive to all of us. It's okay to have doubts. Ask God to help us with our doubts. And Jesus was addressing those doubts, not only in the part of this man, but in the part of his disciples. Now, let's read the next paragraph. 
Are you with me yet? Okay. I hope you're not thinking about a football game that may take place later tonight. <laughs> and when Jesus saw that a crowd came running toward together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, You mute and deaf spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him and never enter him again. And after crying out and convulsing him terribly, it came out and the boy was like a corpse, so that most of them, as most of them said, he is dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he arose. And when he had entered the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could we not cast it out? And he said to them, this kind cannot be driven out by anything but prayer. Just some observations with regard to that paragraph first. Put yourself in the position of Jesus, who sees this man so distraught. His heart had to go out to this boy. This man asked Jesus to show compassion. So often in the scriptures when you're reading Matthew, Mark, and Luke, John, it'll talk about Jesus. He says, when he saw, he was moved with compassion. You'll find that repeatedly, won't you? And the word compassion there is that inner a being, uh, the deep seed of emotions that works. It's more than emotion. It works its way into action. This is just empathy, unless it works its way into action. And Jesus had that kind of compassion. And Jesus showed compassion to this man. Imagine if you're the disciples, you're scratching your head and saying, what went wrong with us? Why couldn't we do it? I'll come back to that. Put yourself in the position of this man with his boy. And while he lacks some faith, we cut him a lot of slack because he's very distraught. He's gone through this every day, extremely emotional probably, and he's without hope other than the disciples and Jesus, and the disciples didn't work. And now he sees Jesus cast this demon out of his son, and perhaps for a moment, he, along with the rest of the group, thought, he's, now he's dead, until Jesus reaches down and lifts him up. I think this whole passage was recorded for us for the purpose of answering the disciples' question in verse 28. Lord, why weren't we able to cast out the demon? Why were, this is the missing piece. This is the missing piece. And Jesus said, this kind comes only by prayer. You'll find with some of, the, some of the English versions of the Bible, it'll say, and fasting. But you'll not find that in some of the, the majority or the oldest and the best manuscripts. Um, and so we, we've just gone with prayer. Obviously, fasting is very, very important, but it's probably... Uh, not to be included in the text that Mark includes here. This kind comes only by prayer. In other words, the work of God cannot be done in human strength. But the disciples are saying, wait a minute. They could say, we cast out demons in Mark chapter 3. We did it the same way. Same process, same procedure, same protocol. We did it in Mark chapter 6. And so in Mark chapter 9, we did it the same way, and it didn't happen. And Jesus is saying to them, the power is not in your, 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 your protocols. The power is not in your procedures. The power is in prayer. That's the missing piece. We've got to have prayer. Now let me pull this together for you. And by the way, that's true today, isn't it? As we face life challenges, as churches can say, we've got the best processes, we've got marketing, we've got our, our system, we've got our chain of command, we've got job descriptions, we're a well-oiled machine. And Jesus said, and there might be a missing piece here, and that is prayer. My Father's house should be called a house of prayer, and God has not ever promised to bless our procedures and our protocols, but it's prayer. Two principles. One, let's pray as we face life's greatest challenges. I don't know what you're like when you face the mountain, but for many, <clears throat> I'm guilty. We face the mountain, 
And we rely on our own resources, our intellect, our giftedness, our experience to go around, above, under, or through. And there's a missing piece. And that's prayer. A few weeks ago, months ago now, I introduced you to Ben Kelly. Or Ben was facing a great life challenge with his young family, uh, cancer, and how cancer could be disruptive and could take your life. And many of you have asked, what's, what's the update? Here's the update. Share with him, if you would. Yeah, well, good morning, everyone. Again, my name is Ben Kelly, and my wife Kathy and I have been uh, coming to Woodside Bible Church for about, uh, about 11 years. We've got three young kids, and as I shared just a couple of months ago, uh, on August 1st, I was diagnosed with stage 3 uh, testicular cancer. I had surgery right away, and that launched me into chemotherapy that I wrapped up right before Thanksgiving. And then since Thanksgiving, I've had a couple of CAT scans that uh, have identified a number of lymph nodes in my neck that need to be removed. So I've got some more surgery scheduled for late March. But relative to everything that we've gone through up to this point, the prognosis is very good, and the doctors are very confident that we'll, we'll have the surgery and then uh, hopefully put, put a lot of this cancer stuff behind us. But, uh, but Doug did ask me to share a couple of things on what we've learned about prayer And we've learned a lot over the last six months, but particularly in the area of prayer, uh, my wife and I, uh, in our personal prayer life, we prayed a lot in those first few days after my diagnosis. And frankly speaking, we prayed as if we didn't trust God. We prayed as if this challenge and this, this storm was too big for God. And so we prayed, God, we don't understand your will, but we hope that everything's going to be okay and going to work out for us. And we had very little peace in praying that way. And so we quickly realized this is our Heavenly Father that we're praying to. Uh, he created us, and he knows the deepest desires of our hearts. And so we began to get very real with God in our prayer life. We prayed for the preservation of my life. We prayed for the opportunity to raise our family together. And we prayed that if that was not God's will, uh, that at the point in time when we had to accept that, that he would administer the grace that we would need to accept that, but that we weren't ready to accept it yet. And we noticed as we changed our prayers that he didn't necessarily give us the assurance that everything was going to be fine, but he did direct us to Scripture. He directed me specifically to James 1, and he directed my wife to 2 Corinthians 4. And as we meditated on his word, we sensed that we could trust him, that he was in control, and that he was teaching us a heck of a lot through this experience. And so we learned, uh, learned how to pray in our personal prayer life. We also learned about the power of, of the prayer of others. I don't know how many people were praying for us, but I sense uh, that it was a lot. And, and, and the most ironic part, I won't even use the word ironic, the most Holy Spirit evident part was that on our deepest, darkest days, both when we were struggling with the diagnosis and when I was struggling with the physical effects of chemotherapy, on those, on those darkest moments where we were losing hope, it never failed that someone would text us and say, we're praying for you right now. And in many cases, they'd write out the prayer that they were praying in a text message. And it, we, we just couldn't believe the way that the Holy Spirit moved and lifted our spirits to know that we were being lifted before the throne of God in prayer and in the current storm. The other thing that we learned, uh, I don't know about you, but when I hear that someone needs prayer, I'm really good at praying like once or maybe twice or maybe even for a couple days, and then inevitably it kind of falls off. And I'm aware that there have been people, uh, people that may be here this morning that have been praying for me every day, my family and I, every day for six months. And it's been unbelievably humbling to recognize that people are that disciplined in lifting up my family and I. And it's something that I've learned and that I want to carry forward. Having been the recipient of that, I want to carry that forward, that, that prayer is not a one-time event. It's an ongoing uh, conversation with God, particularly on behalf of those that are suffering. And so uh, it's been a challenging six months, the most difficult six months of my life. But I'm thankful for what we've learned and what God has taught us. And I'm thankful for the way that we've been lifted up and encouraged by the body of Christ. Yeah. So thank you. We'll keep Ben. Uh, yeah. We want to we want to pray for you again in just a few moments, but after the ten o'clock service today, um, Sam introduced himself to me and he went and talked mm-hmm. to you. Um, a few months ago, when we had Ben here and we gathered around, and prayed for him. Many of you were here, remember that. There was a man who had uh, uh, tuned in uh, in his living room or family room to watch the service that day. Uh, recovering from his own cancer, but he said feeling sorry for himself. And it was that day while we were praying for you uh, that he felt he connected with Jesus, accepted Christ that day as his Savior, and was baptized here two weeks ago. 
So, God works. Thank you. So, what do you do when you face your greatest challenge? It didn't even dawn on the disciples that they should pray. And that's what Jesus was trying to get through to them. You can't do the work of God through human strength. We have to pray. Whatever your challenges are, we all have them, don't we? Whatever the challenges are, let's start with prayer. Let's end with prayer. There's another, another lesson I want us to lock into before we leave in a, a few moments, and this, that's this, is that we pray not only when we face life's greatest challenges, but we pray. We pray to demonstrate the love of God. I love the fact that this man was so burdened by his, his son's condition, and he believed that Jesus could make a difference, and he brought out of his, motivated by his own love for his son, he brings his boy to Jesus and begs him. Wow. Reminds me of the story of Mark chapter 3, where four guys had a friend who was paralyzed. They wanted to bring him to Jesus to find healing. But Jesus was in his house doing all of this teaching, and the house was packed. And so they took this man, four of them, on, with a, on a, this, uh, carrying a stretcher, took him up the stairways in the side of the house onto the flat roof, dug through the roof, and lowered this man, their friend. That's love. We pray for people, and we let them know we're praying for them. That's love. Uh, yesterday, I had an appointment at 11 o'clock um, with a lady named Deborah who has uh, been fighting cancer. Um, I arrived at her house uh, early, pulled down the street a little bit, across the street, and, uh, and just read the scriptures, waiting till the appointment time. I read the scriptures, and my mind, my mind went to a lot of things. It went to the first time I met with Deborah. She came to my office and um, a successful businesswoman, but wanted to, uh, was struggling because she wasn't growing fast enough in her faith. I like that. She wanted to know how to, how to move it along faster. And we shared about Bible study and accountability and groups. And, um, and she went, and that, motivated on her pathway and she began to grow and I watched her and and um, it was fantastic and then she shared with me about her son and the challenges her son was going through with some substance abuse and his daughter and it was breaking her heart we prayed together often for that and then she went through the the death of her 29 year old son and the challenges of that and what that would mean to her granddaughter, his daughter, and then her own cancer, and then the decision she made, and we prayed in my office a few weeks ago that she, um, she made the decision not to continue with, a, not to go with this, this um, chemotherapy round. And she knew that unless God intervened, that means uh, she was close to the gates. And... Um, and I thought, as I, what do I say to this lady today? When we pray, is God able to heal? Jesus made it very clear, where he says, with God all things are possible. So if God is able to heal, and it's not his ability in question, it's our faith that's in question. But what if we pray in faith? Is Deborah not healed because our prayers were not in faith? I don't think so. The point of the passage here is believing enough to pray. Many, many people are praying for Deborah. And it's not a case of either prayers failing or God failing. It's a case where God heals in different ways. And I've watched this over the years, that God may choose to heal at times instantaneously. And we've seen it happen. And the psalmist writes in Psalm 126, when he heals in that way, it's just like, it's like, wow, it's like streams in the Negev. And we, we proclaim, I can't believe this. Can you see what God did? How great is our God? And sometimes the Bible says God intervenes and heals in our lives in different ways. And he talks in the Psalm 126 where we plant the seed and we work and we weep until harvest comes. 
And sometimes the healing is over the course of time and, and in concert with uh, the medical experts of our world. And sometimes the healing is ultimate and we have a funeral and a person is ushered into the presence of the Lord. I'll never understand the will of God. I often pray for this. Most of the time in my life, God has worked in the second way. And during the second, that second means of intervention, I learned so many more lessons than I could have ever learned if he'd done it instantaneously. Eleven o'clock came and I rang the doorbell and went in, only to see that Deborah had lost so much weight since I saw her last. I thought, what do I say to this lady? I've learned probably 30 years ago and never to assume their prayer request. You may visit somebody in the hospital and assume their prayer request is to be healed. Um, and oftentimes there's something greater on their hearts. And so I always ask, and as I did yesterday, I said, Deborah, how can I pray for you today? She smiled and she looked at me and she said, well, I've got this lady coming to church with me. She's come with the last three weeks. And I want to make sure she comes to know Jesus. Would you pray about that? I said, I will. She mentioned another woman that we both know. She says, she doesn't know Jesus yet. Would you pray that through this she comes to know Jesus? And she mentioned a third. I thought, wow. That's a father with a son. We pray to demonstrate the love that God has given us for people. What I'd like to do here in the next uh, few minutes is just pray again as we did that day with Ben. Um, I'd love us to stand in just a moment in groups of whatever you're comfortable, two, three, four, five. And um, nobody has to pray. Um, don't feel uncomfortable, but folks, we live in a real world where we all have real life challenges. And let's stop trying to will our way through them and let's pray. Let's pray. Um, don't feel like you have to pray. Don't feel like you have to pray some flowery prayer. I think one of the most beautiful prayers ever prayed uh, uh, at Woodside that in my presence was a Tuesday morning Bible study many years ago. And the prayer started from a, a new guy to our Bible study. He prayed like this. He says, hi, God. This is Vern. We've never met. I've not, never talked to you before. That's how his prayer started. And I thought, how beautiful, just from his heart. Would you, um, as we stand in a moment, if, there, if you have a life need and you say, just pray for me, I've got a family issue. Pray for me, I've got... And somebody from that group, if you'd lead in prayer. Or maybe you've got somebody you know that has an issue. Would you in love for them, first name only, just say, pray for Bill and his fight with cancer. Pray for my friends who are fighting for their marriage. And then would somebody from your group lead in prayer. Let's stand together.